This first one, read less. There are better things to do with your time. His second one, forget dieting. It's easier to gain weight than to lose it. Third, he said, I'm going to stop exercising. It's just a waste of time. Fourth, he said, watch more TV. There are too many good programs to be missing out on. Sixth, he said, I, I, I want to procrastinate more. You didn't want to do those things anyway. He said, I'll drink more. It's no fun to be sober. He said, I'll start being more superstitious. I'll spend more time at work. The boss won't approve time off anyway. It said, I'll stop bringing food home. There's plenty of fast food restaurants out there. It said, I'll take up a new habit. Maybe swear, who knows? Those are terrible. <laughs> 
New Year's resolution. No, no matter how realistic they are that we can achieve them, those were terrible. And of course, the father was disappointed because he wasn't making the most of his time. And timing is everything. Timing is everything. I know that that's an idiom that we've all heard before. It's an old saying that implies that the success of something is often influenced by when it happens. The perfect time to buy stocks or property or even assets are while the value is down. The perfect time to exercise, they say, is in the morning. Said the worst time to start a business is during the recession or depression. And the worst time to study is five minutes before the test. And SpongeBob said the best time to wear striped sweaters is all the time. Still, the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 3 that there's an appointed time for everything. Amen. That there is a time for every matter under heaven. A time for birth and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to throw stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to shun embracing. A time to search and a time to give up on what is lost. A time to tear apart and a time to sew together. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. There was a time for peace and a time for war. How do I know when the time is right? How do I know when the time is right? To ask her for her number. How do I know when the time is right? To reply back to his DM. How do I know? When to start a business? When to end a relationship? I often throughout my life have struggled with timing. A lot of times my timing was off. I think of Moses feeling the burden of his people being enslaved to the Egyptians took it upon himself to strike the slaveholder, causing him to die. He, he had the right intentions, but the timing was off. He wasn't waiting on God. God had a plan for him to set his people free, but it wasn't the Nat Turner way. And waiting on God is important important when getting our time right. I can hear my mom saying now. I can hear her voice saying, now is the time for that. You ever heard that? Yeah. Now just ain't the time for that. Now just ain't the time for that. It'd be me trying to tell a joke or trying to uh, be funny when things should be taken serious and she just giving me that. <coughs> I just said it or not. You know, timing is everything. Especially when I was trying to be a comedian or a class clown. Sometimes it's just not the appropriate time. So today I want to continue with part two of our two-part and our proofs positive series. I explained last week that proof positive simply meant absolute evidence that cannot be doubted, disputed, or disproved. I talked, as we discussed in John 1 last week, of the three heuristic proofs, which were logos, ethos, and pathos. Pathos. That's it. That's it. The logos, ethos, and pathos. And the logos was the thoughtful word, logic. The ethos was character or ethic. And the pathos was the ability to share someone's feelings, empathy. And today I'm going to share with you three more proofs. Rhetorical proofs. Also from 
the Greek concepts to wrap this whole thing up. Not proofs of science or proofs of mathematics, but more proofs of literature and writing. These three final proofs are the kairos, the topos, and the telos. The kairos, topos, and telos. Kairos. Scripture says that, but when the fullness of time came, God sent his son, born of a woman and born under a law, the law. The kairos refers to the opportune moment. The opportune moment. It's, it's the idea of striking while the iron is hot. The ideal moment, the opportune moment, God's perfect timing. How many people understand that God is in control? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, he is. And with God being in control, he's not just in control over our lives or the world, but God is also in control of time. And God is never too early, nor is he too late. For the old saints said, God is always on time. Always on time. And Habakkuk 2 and 3 says that for the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hurries towards the goal and will not fail. Though it delays, wait for it. For it, it certainly will come and not delay long. God is coming in this time. I know that things don't always get done in our time. At the time, we want them to be done. But they'll be done in God's time. You just hold on, and God will work this thing out. Sometimes if you did it too soon, you'd miss it. You wouldn't understand it. It wouldn't click to you. you take it for granted. Anybody ever take things for granted? Yes. <laughs> I, I, am I the only person that takes things nope. for granted? When, when, when my dad used to say, uh, I, I'm going to let you pay for those shoes because if I get them, you're going to tear them up and they're going to be tore up in a couple weeks. He said, it, ain't it funny how you bought those Air Force <laughs> ones or whatever and you made sure they're taken care of. You don't want them to get scuff marks in them. You don't, it, 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 sometimes it's about the time and also your investment of time labor, energy, and effort that we put into things that make us appreciate it more. Sometimes God wants you to wait just so you can learn a little bit of appreciation. Amen. God's perfect timing. God's perfect timing is so evident in Scripture. When, when we think about Scriptures, when we think about history in general, how God used language, literature, the land and his love. God used language. We know that from history that Alexander the Great conquered what was the known world at his time. This was a time where uh, the world would have been fragmented in, in many places, but in conquering the world, he created uh, one system of government, but more importantly, one system, a common system of language to communicate. He did that, creating one common language to communicate and to get ideas as far as trading thoughts, uh, ideologies, myths, legends, history, and stories with each other, uh, as far as trading goods and services with each other. It brought the world together, though it tore the world apart to do it. Uh, in, in literature, from biblical prophecies to other Messiah myths, or even we look at the Astrology, as we see the wise men, uh, the magi in the scriptures who read the stars and knew that a king was born in Israel. Oh, how majestic, how wonderful is that? Uh, we think of the land, how the connection of the, the, the roads to Rome, all roads lead to Rome. Uh, the, 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 the Roman connection and bringing all these great cities, large cities together and having common pathways and highways and byways that connect them to allow people to travel to and fro and not get lost so easily when you're able to follow roads and, 
You think about our highway signs and how 75 can get you from here to Atlanta to Miami Beach if you wanted to go that far, or how things connect. And that was the same idea, concept that was in Rome at the time. So God, in his perfect timing, when he sent his Messiah to be born, it was he was born in the opportune time. God's perfect timing that would allow what was Christianity to flourish. Because now there's no language barriers, or, or there's limited language barriers. And when there were barriers, God just touched the tongues of the saints and allowed them to speak in tongues to communicate in the languages of the world. But God used the common languages of the Greek and the common Greek to get the word across the world faster. God used the literature, the idea that people were hungry, were thirsty, were waiting, anticipating a Messiah-like figure. They were waiting for someone to come. Maybe to save them from their political oppression. Maybe to save them from their religious oppression. But Jesus came at that time to save them from their spiritual oppression. But there was a hunger and a desire and a look out for. People were looking for who is the Messiah when he come. Things can't get no worse than they are now. So this means that God must be coming because it's always darkest before dawn. And that was their perception and their idea. And then lastly, it was the land that was able to connect all these roads that were able to get the gospel from little old Jerusalem to deep into Africa and Ethiopia and to India and into Spain and France and, uh, France and into uh, Italy and Rome and to, to spread the gospel throughout the world that, world that by a hundred years later after the death of Christ, uh, they said they went into South Africa to the, 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 the most uh, obscure villages and the gospel had already been preached there. Mm. Oh, that, 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 that God's opportune time made for everything to flourish and to flourish quickly. But I can imagine them waiting from when God spoke his last words and Micah and shut the book and no one heard a word from God. To, to, to be put off a little bit, to be, be like, God, where are you? God, when are you coming? God, we're crying out. And God is saying, just hold on. I got this thing figured out. I got a plan for this thing. I'm going to make this thing work, and it's going to work. And, and it, it's just not going to work for you, but it's going to work for everybody. And, and, and God wants to work things out in your life to bless you, that not that you'll be blessed and you'll have enough to get out and to get along and you'll be okay and you'll have something to eat, but God wants to bless you so that you can be a blessing to others. Yeah. Uh, don't you want that blessing? Yeah. God bless me so much financially that I can be a blessing to others financially. Oh, God, don't, don't just increase my finances, increase my time. God, 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 increase. when God blesses you so much that you just can't hold it to yourself. God does that in his perfect time. God's time. God's time. The Kairos. Then there's the two poles. The Bible says that so that God may redeem those who were under the law that God sent his son in his perfect time so that God can redeem those who were under the law that they may receive the adoption as sons. The two most is which makes something familiar. That which makes something familiar. In writing, it's the idea of using tropes or metaphors or even to an extent parables. It's using things that are common to shed light on things that may be uncommon. It's finding a common play so, so, so that I can, I can make this make sense to you. Let me use something that you're familiar with. So Jesus will often speak of the kingdom of heaven. And he will say, the kingdom of heaven is like, see, see, you don't know what the kingdom of heaven is like. I can't really explain to you what the kingdom of heaven is like, but, but I'll do my best, and I'll tell you that the kingdom of heaven is like a man who, 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 who found the treasure buried in the field. And he went and sold all of his possessions 
so that he can buy that field to own that treasure that was in that field. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's so valuable. It's, it's, it's so much worth in it. And, and, and so the people will understand or, or, or just get a glimpse of the understanding that Jesus was trying to convey. He would use these parables and metaphors, similes and allegories to give you an idea, to find the commonplace, to expand upon from theirs, to, to pull out the whole theme of something, the, the, the titles. And, and, and God is saying that, 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 that there's a thing that I'm trying to do, and, and I, I'm trying to do this, and I, 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 I want to make it familiar, because I want to make you family. I want to make it familiar to you, so I, I want to make it family. We, we know that God is anthropomorphic. What is it? God is not a man. God does not have human body parts. When the Bible says that God has an ear, he doesn't literally have an ear. God is a spirit. When, when, when the Bible says the hands of God, when God, the, the, the spirit of God doesn't literally have a hand, but it operates like our hand. He, he listens like our ears. He reaches out like our hands. He works like our hands. He moves like our feet. He, he, he doesn't have those things. It's, it's just to shed light on the big idea of who God is. God is too big for us to contain in our human words. But we try to describe these things that we don't understand using things that we do understand. And that's the tofos. That, that, that's to help to draw in the largest amount of audience so that the most people can get it, the twofold. And God wants you to get it. So he wants to write his vision and make it plain so that you can get the tablets and run with them. And then there is the telos. The telos. See, the Bible says that in, in verse 6, says, God did this. He he waited to the perfect moment, the opportune time, to send his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law and to call them sons and daughters. He, he, that, that, he did this because you are sons and daughters. God has sent his spirit, the spirit, of the Son into your heart, crying out, Abba, Father. The telos is the end goal. The end goal. What the, what's the reason for all of this? What are you getting at? What are you getting to? The telos, the, the end goal, God's end goal. For Christ, the end goal and his natural body was the cross. He was born to go to the cross. Amen. His Amen. purpose was to suffer. His purpose was to be crucified. His purpose was to be pierced in his side. The end though was the crucifixion. Paul said, if I preach Christ, well, if I don't preach Christ and preach him crucified. That is the purpose of Christ's existence in time and in space. To take on, on the cross, our sin and our transgression. To, to, to take on our wrongdoing. And not just take on all of our sins and our transgressions so that we can be forgiven, but to also put on us his goodness, his righteousness, the telos, the ultimate purpose. And the ultimate purpose for you, God says, is to not conform to the world, but to be transformed through the renewing of your mind. Which is to prove the will of God. Yeah. And what the will of God is, both perfect and acceptable will of God. Yeah. The, the, the end goal 
God has for you is to make you, the Bible says, sons and daughters. No longer slaves, no longer a slave to your own misfortunes. No longer a slave to your own bad timing. No longer a slave to circumstance. A slave to your desires and your wants and whims, but a slave to righteousness, Amen. which will make you <laughs> sons of the Father. We can no longer be in shame by the things that had us in shame in 2021, things that had us bound. We got to let go of guilt. We got to let go of shame. We got to learn to forgive ourselves and love ourselves. Then we can forgive others and love others. God is trying to work something out in you. And now is the time. God, the Father in time, has sent his son. Apostello is the, is the word sent. It's the term we get apostles from. It means sent ones. God sent his son. He apostled, God apostled his son. The son sent the spirit. The son apostled the spirit. And he sent the spirit into our hearts that cry out, our crying, dying hearts, to heal us and to make us whole. And to make us sons and daughters, heirs, to him. And now that we are sons, and if God is sending his son into the world, then God will also send us. Amen. God is sending you with the greatest of commissions. And he's sending you now. Now is the appropriate hour. Now is the perfect time. There is no better time than now. The past is gone. The future, though filled with promise, is not promised. So next year, we don't want to be in here talking about last year, I should. Hmm. Now is when God is called. Step into God's call. Now is when you pray more. Amen. Now is when you budget better. I'm like, oh, I need to budget. I'm like, now is when you budget better. Amen. Now is when you study more. <laughs> Now is when you show more restraint. Now is when you stick to the promises you've made, especially the promises that you've made yourself. Amen. Now is where you get involved in the harvest. Now is when you cut off those loose ends. You know it ain't no good for you. You know she ain't no good for you. You know he ain't no good. Now is when you cut off loose ends and stop wasting time. It's where you work things out more. Where you work out more. Where you become the best version of you. And you start by being better than you were yesterday. Not better than the next person. Don't compare yourself to them. Better, compare yourself to who you were yesterday and become better than that person. Now is the perfect time. And time is everything. I've given you what the Lord has given me. May the Lord have blessings to the Lord. Don't wait.
God is calling you now. He is reaching for you now. He is pulling at your heart now. God's time and waiting on Him. He will do what He said He would do. Just hold on. 